you to Canada Post for, for having me today. Uh, thanks, thanks to everybody as well for taking the time out of your day to join us. I know there's a lot of online content these days, so thank you very much for investing the time to uh, be with us today. Um, as Nadia mentioned, I'm the Global Trade Director uh, for the Consumer Team on Export Development Canada's Trade Connections Group. Very happy to be with you today. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, so for today, uh, a few things we're going to be going over. The first few bullets uh, simply mention the uh, overview of EDC that I'll be providing. Uh, and one of the key takeaways there uh, that I want everybody to, to bring home is really that uh, EDC, uh, yes, we work with a lot of big companies, but uh, small companies actually make up a much bigger uh, part of our mix of, of client base. Uh, so no matter the size, uh, we are interested in working with you. Uh, and then I will uh, give an overview of some of our uh, specific solutions, uh, talk about international e-commerce and consumer behaviors, and of course, uh, what would uh, a presentation in 2020 be without a bit of conversation around uh, the impact of COVID? Next slide, please. So our mission is to help companies go, grow, and succeed in markets around the world. We are a crown corporation, which means that we are uh, uh, we operate on commercial principles, but our shareholder is the government of Canada. So that's the that's the tie-in with the, the government there. This slide has a lot going on, but really, again, I uh, want to focus in on that uh, the the pie chart in the center. Uh, Eighty-six percent of our uh, client base is made up of small and medium enterprises, and that's of a chunk of uh, sixteen thousand eight hundred companies. Uh, so again, really, just want to drive that home that. Uh, even if you're, and the other pieces, even if you're just selling a few packages overseas, uh, maybe some packages to the U.S., uh, you are still an exporter and we're still uh, interested in talking to you. So our core products uh, are broken up into these four categories. On the financial front, uh, the two, uh, we, we have many products, but the ones I'll mention are the ones that are likely to be uh, most interesting to this group. Uh, on the financial front, we have our export guarantee program, uh, which in, in very short, uh, short description is that uh, we work with your financial institution to ensure that your operating line is at the same level that you would like it to be. So we can, we can look at providing a guarantee to provide some comfort to your bank to take on some additional risk. Uh, another uh, product that's common in, in the consumer space or in the, in the retail space is if you have uh, suppliers abroad who are asking for a standby letter of credit. Your bank is likely holding a cash to collateralize those letters of credit. We have a solution that can step in and help liberate some of those funds. Our most popular product is our insurance product that comes receivable insurance or credit insurance. Uh, quite simply, that is insurance to ensure you get paid by your international customers. Our knowledge business is one uh, that's relatively new. It's uh, been around for a few years now, uh, but I'm gonna save that for the end because we have a very exciting uh, announcement at the end of this presentation, uh, a new product that's rolling out in just two weeks. Uh, and you're actually the first group outside of EDC to uh, be privy to that. So very excited to share that with you. And then finally, the connections group is the group that I'm a part of, and I think is best explained by showing you the next two slides. Uh, so we'll jump over to the next one. So this, this is a map of our uh, roughly 20 uh, Canadian offices. So this is what helps me and, and my colleagues really understand the Canadian landscape. What are the skills and capabilities here in Canada in the retail space? What are some of the brands uh, across different categories here in Canada? And then we pair that with the next slide, uh, which is a map of our international representation. So again, just about uh, a little over 20 inter uh, international representations. Uh, and, and our colleagues in these markets uh, help us understand what the, who the players are in those markets, uh, what, what types of products these players are looking for, what kind of solutions they're looking for. And then my role is really to bring those two networks together and, uh, and tie international opportunities with the skill set of our Canadian companies. Bit of a matchmaking service, if you will. So now jumping into uh, international consumer behavior. Uh, a lot of the stuff that I'll be talking about is uh, some of the basic uh, marketing four Ps, uh, but uh, really important, especially as you go international, to really uh, drive a lot of these things home. Um, so we'll go to the next slide here. So the really important part is um, to be where your customer is. Uh, and 
you know, the first bullet there, mobile, uh, bricks and mortar, social, uh, social um, really that is the buzzword omni-channel. And it's a buzzword that's used often, but it's a buzzword that's really tough to not mention. Uh, and to really drive that home, I'm gonna bring up uh, some data from McKinsey. Uh, and it's, it's focused on China, uh, but China uh, has a lot of uh, consumer behaviors that are sort of ahead of what we might see in North America. Uh, they're quick to adopt uh, mobile, for example, uh, quick to adopt uh, online. Uh, so this information is quite interesting. Uh, while shopping in physical retail, 63% of shoppers are on their mobile device doing research on the products that they're browsing. That's twice the rate at which this was happening just two years ago. And of those, 81% of them are sticking with the brand that they're visiting at that moment and then 55% are converting in store. And then the other 19% go elsewhere. So just another example of uh, omni-channel and how uh, that all ties in together. Um, important to know as well, uh, whether to go direct to consumer or on a platform, uh, there are many pros and cons of each, uh, but important to know the consumer in the market that you're targeting, uh, where are they gonna be? Uh, and you wanna be where the, where the customer is gonna be. Uh, if it's a platform, which platform? Uh, so if you have a uh, product targeted, uh, let's say it's a baby skincare, you might want to consider instead of going on one of the one of the large platforms, maybe you want to go on one of the niche platforms that caters to mother and baby. Uh, and then of course, uh, 3PL, reverse logistics, uh, that's, that's a one way of getting um, uh, making sure that your returns are properly handled and uh, that that process is transparent to your customer and that customer service is available to your customer while they're browsing the site. Uh, so if you're targeting Australia, for example, uh, you want to have people responding to uh, your customer chat uh, in, in their time zone and using some of the lingo and uh, local uh, language that, uh, that is used there. And Amazon isn't the only global player. That's something that's important to, to know. Uh, I'll ask you to just take 10 quick seconds. If we were in a room here, I would uh, play a bit of a game here, but um, take, a, take a quick moment, look at the countries here, and then look at the logos and try to pair up uh, the different e-commerce platforms and marketplaces with the country. And I'll explain which, which goes with which after. Excellent. So South Korea is Lotte Group, China, Tmall, Japan, Rakuten, India, Flipkart, UK, Argos, Germany, Auto, and um, Mexico is Mercado Libre. Uh, and it's worth noting as well that, you know, the, the countries with the, the most people in the world, India and China, um, they, they make up 2.7 billion uh, people globally, and the, their top e-commerce platforms are not Amazon. So just something worth, uh, worth noting there as well. Next slide, please. Case study in international e-commerce. So I wanted to bring up an example of uh, one of my uh, real life clients um, and uh, wanted to walk through some of their uh, thought process and, and their uh, journey going international. Uh, so this company had strong growth in North America. They started off with uh, direct to consumer sites in Canada and in the US. Um, they were able to leverage those sites to gain insights uh, into these markets and uh, you, leveraging Google Analytics as well to see uh, some of the other uh, broader data. Uh, and they were able to see uh, some of the other international markets that were interested in their brand. Um, as a result of this data and as a result of them being able to, to own all of this uh, end to end, they, uh, they launched in the UK and in Australia. Um, so Australia is an interesting market for them as uh, they, they realized through their analytics that uh, most of their Australian uh, customers actually thought that it was an Australian company. Uh, and that actually turned out to work to their advantage. And they kind of played into that. They didn't, I mean, they don't, they don't uh, say that they're an Australian company, but they don't necessarily tout the fact that they're a Canadian company and that uh, a lot of their product is actually manufactured here in Canada. Uh, in order to do this, they had to manage multiple payment platforms and logistics partners. Um, and they went uh, direct to consumer in all the markets that they're operating in, uh, except for China. Uh, 
Uh, so China is uh, a bit of a unique market for e-commerce in that um, most of the business that's done there is not through uh, company websites, it's through their marketplaces. Um, and now uh, they are a, an EDC customer leveraging some of our financial and insurance products. We'll go on to the uh, next slide, please. Excellent. So this is speaking to uh, e-commerce in China. As I mentioned, uh, I could uh, speak for uh, probably hours on, on just this topic alone. Um, a, a few stats here that I like to, to use. 25% um, of retail sales are online in China. Uh, now compare that to about 9% in the US. Uh, I also like to compare Black Friday and uh, Singles Day. Singles Day is starting to make its way into North America and there's starting to see some singles day sales here. Uh, but just a couple of years ago, um, most people had never heard of singles day. Uh, it's a shopping holiday uh, for 1111, uh, which is 1111, therefore singles day, sort of the antithesis of uh, Valentine's Day. Um, to give an example here of the, the sheer sales volume that, that's there, um, if you look at Black Friday to uh, Cyber Monday in the US in 2018, all retailers totaled for roughly 18 billion US dollars. If you look at Alibaba's platforms alone in 24 hours, they hit uh, just over $30 billion. So that's just one platform in 24 hours. Now layer on top of that JD.com, and now you're talking 54 billion. And this is data from 2018, and, and this uh, divide continues to grow uh, year over year. Important to know that the two, two major players in China are Alibaba and JD. Uh, they make up for roughly 88% market share, depending on how you look at the data. And then WeChat is the uh, super app of China where uh, people tend to interact with the brand. They do a lot of uh, brand discovery there, uh, interact with your brand. If there's any Q and A, it's, it's often done through that. Uh, and then it's also a payment platform. So uh, payment platforms there are primarily WeChat Pay and Alipay. Um, and uh, another interesting note is your website in China. Uh, if you're targeting, seriously targeting China, uh, it's very important for you to have a .cn uh, website that's hosted within China. Uh, through peak hours, the internet is throttled and uh, it can take anywhere from 60 to 90 seconds for your website to load. And I'm not sure about you, but I know myself, if I'm shopping online and a website takes more than about five seconds to load, I'm on to the next one. Uh, so that's just a, an, another particularity of the market. Um, now, the, the particularities of the market, uh, that list is very long, uh, but one thing that's really important is to have partners. Uh, so if you have uh, proper partners for making that uh, market entry, they can help out with a lot of these different particularities and help you navigate that. Uh, in fact, most of the platforms in China don't allow international brands to sell on their platforms unless they have an approved uh, trade partner to, that they're working with. And if you're interested in any of those, uh, feel free to reach out. I'd be happy to uh, connect you to any of those partners. So now, um, again, 2020, can't talk about 20, uh, anything really without bringing up COVID. Um, so let's bring up the, yeah, perfect, thank you. Uh, it's not all doom and gloom. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of uh, positive changes that I think came out of uh, COVID. And I, I think a lot of uh, consumer behaviors will be here to stay. Um, China, and uh, continuing on the, the China piece, just for one more moment, um, the culture there was very much uh, that you would return home from work, you would pick up some groceries at a market along the way, you make, you bought whatever you needed uh, for your dinner that evening. Um, people started, uh, they were really, because there was no alternative, uh, buying their groceries online. Uh, and, and that's expected to really stick around and be a, a trend that's going to that's going to stay. And it's the same in North America. A lot of the feedback from people is that, hey, maybe ordering online and getting my groceries and having somebody else pick my apples uh, isn't such a big deal. Uh, the apparel space is, is one that, uh, you know, it's done well online, but I know there are a lot of demographics that are uncomfortable with it. Uh, if you think about my mother, for example, uh, she's in her early 60s and prior to COVID uh, was very reluctant to purchase any sort of apparel online. Uh, she's discovered a few uh, Canadian retailers online and has, has uh, uh, I can promise you that she will continue to purchase online. Uh, she's been a big fan uh, and will continue to be a big fan post-COVID. 
food delivery. Uh, of course, a lot of our favorite restaurants uh, left to uh, with no alternative really. Uh, so they're uh, shipping on, um, sorry, uh, online orders. Uh, you can pick up uh, at the restaurant. Some of them are shipping uh, to your house, drop off at your house. Uh, a lot of changes in that space as well. Uh, the other thing is that it's accelerated a lot of trends that were already in motion. Uh, so we spoke about e-grocery, uh, but about the retooling of physical retail as well. Um, you know, a, a lot of stores uh, became uh, curbside pickup centers, uh, centers for returns. Uh, a lot of people felt a lot more comfortable ordering something online if they knew that it would be easy for them to go and exchange it uh, locally. Um, uh, you know, there there were, um, I talk about a little bit in the reinvention place but, uh, section, but uh, virtual communities were um, created. So instead of leveraging your your uh, your physical retail for simply browsing product, uh, some of them were even using them as centers to distribute uh, meal kits for frontline uh, workers. Um, one of the key things that I think has come out of COVID and, and in talking to my customers uh, is really the emphasis and really how much of a light has been shown on the importance of diversification. And that comes really in, in on two sides, one of them from your supply chain. So if you're able to manufacture at least some of your product domestically, uh, if, if for example, you manufacture the rest in China, uh, it might be a good idea for you to have a, a third market where you're producing product. Uh, because if one uh, market is interrupted and that supply chain is suddenly uh, brought to a halt, you have other supply chain uh, uh, sources that will help you kind of smooth that, uh, that transition or, or smooth that, uh, that bump so you're not left with no product coming in. The same goes for your target markets. Uh, if you have only Canada and the US, for example, uh, we have very closely closely tied uh, economies. Um, it, you know, if, if there is something that happens to one, often our economies are so closely tied uh, that there is some impact that is felt with the other. Um, so it's important to diversify geographically as well in terms of your buyer base. Uh, it can really help you smooth out your uh, the impact to your revenues. It has also forced a lot of brands to reinvent themselves um, and reinvent uh, the way that they do business. Uh, an example is pop-up shops. Uh, pop-up shops were traditionally used uh, for uh, testing product, uh, gauging in, uh, consumer interest in a particular market, uh, gauging sizing feedback, things like that. Uh, but now uh, for the upcoming holiday season, you're hearing from retailers who are using pop-ups simply as overflow. Uh, because their their physical retail is uh, so limited to the number of shoppers that can be in the store uh, that they need overflow uh, to be able to, uh, to to sell to their customers who who want to have that in store experience. Uh, virtual communities, I mentioned the uh, the food for frontline workers, but uh, it can also be used. You know, I work with um, uh, a couple of running brands. Uh, and instead of having physical running groups, uh, they shifted online. So having that online community uh, and the ability for uh, their their fans to interact online and to, to schedule runs and uh, talk about their runs that they did individually as a group afterwards was a way for them to adjust. And then a lot of companies also did a bit of a pivot in focus. Uh, I wasn't able to tune in to the Harry Rosen presentation, but uh, if you go to their website as an example, on their homepage, uh, I think I saw one photo of a suit um, and that's because uh, they've really shifted the focus of their landing page uh, on, on more casual clothing. Uh, this personally is the first time that I wear a blazer since February and I used to wear them on a, on a weekly basis. Um, so if you have a, a, an agile online presence, you're able to quickly pivot and adjust to uh, the needs of, of your uh, customers. And uh, think about ways that you can differentiate yourself as well. Uh, you know, there are Canadian companies in the augmented reality space that can help you uh, build a, a, your product images that they can actually visualize what the product might look like in your space. Uh, you know, there's one that um, sells tents and you can actually go inside the tent with your iPad, uh, visually inspect the inside of the tent, see how big it is relative to your, your room, et cetera. Um, and another company that I like uh, personally is uh, called Dewar. It's a, a, an apparel company, a Canadian apparel company. And they really leverage their user community to, to uh, gather a lot of feedback on sizing. 
So when you're when you're looking at different products, you can really see if uh, if the user feedback is that you know this particular product uh, tends to uh, run small or run large, and you can sort of order the size. Uh, uh, according to that feedback, and it really helps you uh, have some extra confidence as you're placing your order. Go to the next slide, please. And this is the piece that I was excited to share with you. Uh, first time that EDC is exposing this uh, externally. Um, we are launching a new application in the Shopify App Store. So it's called the EDC Export Help Hub. Um, it's it's a Q&A application uh, with a major international focus, but uh, we've also brought in some uh, COVID related questions as well. Uh, so some uh, domestic uh, resources for uh, dealing with COVID and some of the resources that are available to you. Um, internationally, it has a, a major focus on US, Mexico and China. Um, but essentially, I'll, I'll walk you through, through a few of the screenshots, but enter your question, it'll provide you with a number of recommended uh, responses. And um, uh, if the feedback that you're getting and the resources that you're being recommended uh, aren't exactly what you're looking for, uh, you're, you're uh, prompted to uh, send in a request, which will be sent to a real live uh, EDC trade advisor, and they'll get back to you within three days with additional information, and you can begin to engage with, uh, with our trade advisor. Uh, it's absolutely free to use, and it launches on October 5th. Uh, so the screenshot that, that you just saw is where you would enter the, uh, the question. This screenshot shows you um, uh, what the results might look like. And finally, you can advance um, one more. Uh, you'll see a form. And this is the form where you can submit the question. And as I mentioned, this goes to a real life person, a real life trade advisor at EDC who will respond to you. And uh, if, if required, you can begin uh, to engage in conversation with them. So that wraps up um, my portion of the presentation. Um, if we just advance one more slide, uh, I would just encourage you that if you have any further questions, uh, feel free to reach out. My email address is there. Uh, my colleague, Laura Richardson, is also uh, in the, uh, I believe she's in the expo hall. Uh, feel free to reach out to her with any questions you might have on some of our uh, core financial or insurance products. Or if you want more information on how to get in touch with me, uh, she can help you out with that as well. Thanks again. Perfect. Thank you so much, uh, Brian. What a great uh, start to this breakout session and what a great tool you're launching. I'm sure it will help a lot of Canadian merchants. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us again. I'm Annika Fev, Business Development and Commerce Manager at Canada Post. I work with merchants to uh, optimize their e-commerce presence and logistics and hopefully help them grow their business within and beyond uh, Canadians' borders. Um, so big thank you, Brian, for confirming that there are a lot of opportunities out there for retailers that are already exporting or looking at exporting internationally. Um, and to build up of some of the current trend and uh, inside um, across international markets um, that you've shared, Brian, I would like to ask you some questions and you're welcome to ask me some if you would like. Um, where would you like to start? Well, I'd actually like to start off with a question for you. I feel like I've been uh, talking for a little while there, so let's uh, let's give you a turn. <laughs> uh, so many Canadian retailers expand internationally by first going to the U.S. Uh, what are some key considerations for Canadian e-merchants shipping to the U.S. and how can they optimize their approach in the current landscape? Yeah, great question, and that's one that I often get from uh, from different retailer. Uh, definitely, uh, type of product, value of product, the weight. Uh, looking to see who are their competitor in the U.S., how many other people are selling their product to the U.S. Obviously, with the low Canadian dollar and the eight hundred dollar uh, minimum. Uh, before there's any taxes or duties being charged to uh, Canadian product going to the U.S., it does open a lot of doors for some Canadian merchants to uh, expand to the USA in a really competitive way. Um, another consideration, obviously, you talk about COVID, and that's a consideration right now. It is super important to have really clear transit time and expectation for, for your uh, American customers so they know when to expect their product. Uh, we'd be really clear uh, and off, offer more than one level of service if they're willing to have it faster. Um, often people will be willing to pay a little bit more. And um, in regards to $800, what is super important, just a side note, mention it on your website. So don't take for granted that Americans know that when they order from a Canadian merchant that 
uh, there will be no taxes or duties. So everybody got that bad news uh, at some point, ordering internationally and receiving a big, big bill. So it's important, let them know, and let them know also that if it is more than $800, that there might be taxes and duties that will be uh, charged upon delivery. So uh, no, uh, no surprise when it's being delivered. Finally, I would say, um, don't fear shipping costs, uh, obviously depending on the size of the item and the weight. In some cases, shipping to Canada, uh, to USA is not that much more expensive than shipping within Canada. And that's often uh, when I have conversations with merchants, they're, they're surprised to see that. So uh, it's worth a look. Excellent. And transparency is something that, that comes up often. So I am happy uh, you touched on that as well. For sure. Um, on on your side, Brian, what would you say are the two greatest barrier that you hear from Canadian merchants selling or looking to sell abroad? The two greatest barriers, I would say, uh, primarily related to cost. Uh, so everything from cost to, uh, like you said, fear of the cost of uh, shipping, uh, but also the the fear of the cost around uh, doing a, pro a proper uh, brand launch. Um, the other piece is uh, there's a lot of fear around logistics and customs. Um, so around the costs, you know, there, there are uh, organizations that offer solutions for you. EDC is one of those. I've touched on a couple of them. The Trade Commissioner Service has their CAN export program that you can leverage. BDC has uh, market study uh, solutions. Um, and the cost doesn't always have to be high. Uh, you can leverage social media to uh, gain uh, market insights and to gauge uh, uh, consumer interest in your product. And then you can also leverage uh, marketplaces. Uh, if you launch on a, on a marketplace and you're able to collect feedback from customers, uh, you can look what your reviews are, what's the, you know, is, is there a trend in the type of feedback that your product is getting in that particular market that you're not used to getting that maybe you need to adjust your, 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 either your brand positioning or the product itself for that market. Uh, those are all the types of insights that you can get. Uh, and as well, um, uh, micro geographies as well. If we look at the U.S., often you can look at the U.S. as, as seven entirely different markets. Uh, so that can help you see if you've got a certain pickup in a in a particular uh, region over another. Sure. And then uh, logistics and customs. I mean, you're the you're the expert on that. I would I would I would turn it over to you for for that piece. Yeah, just a small note, then I will pass it to uh, to Nadia on the custom for sure. Um, you know, people are afraid often of custom. Uh, postal clearance offer usually a little bit more flexible flexibility for a first time uh, shipper to US or international, less information is required. So there are some way around uh, and having a good knowledge of your product and the restriction in the countries you're shipping is really important also. Um, so we'll pass it over to Nadia. Thank you. First, I want to thank you everybody for being there today and thank you, Brian, for your participation. That was great talking with you.